Coffee in Ireland is an enormous industry today, bringing in hundreds of millions of euros every year. This modern industry is a pretty recent development. When I was growing up in the 1980s and 1990s, the only coffee available was really only instant coffee. However, Ireland's relationship with coffee did not begin in the last 20 years. If anything, we're living through the second or even third wave of coffee culture to hit this country. In this, the first of two episodes on the Irish history of coffee, I'll be tracing the origins of coffee in Ireland. This will take us inside coffee houses in 18th century Dublin when coffee was an elite drink in society. We will also lift the lid on a darker side to the Irish history of coffee. In the second half of the show, we will head to Cuba to look at the story of an Irishman who became one of the largest coffee producers in Cuba in the later 19th century. Hello and welcome to the Irish History Podcast. My name is Finn Dewar and this is An Irish History of Coffee, Part 1. I hope this finds you well and that you're slowly adjusting to this new reality we're all living through. I just want to start with a little word of thanks to the supporters of the show on Patreon. They are the people who have made it possible for me to increase the production of the show while we're all having to go through social distancing. Thanks for the support, it means an awful lot and makes such a big difference. As a way of saying thanks, patrons of the show now have access to a weekly bonus series on medieval life, as well as access to my two audiobooks, 1348, A Medieval Apocalypse, and another on the life of Brian Baru. You can find out more at patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Now to the Irish history of coffee. While coffee dominates the world today, it has very humble origins. And while so many Irish people start today with a cup of coffee, the story begins far from Ireland. According to legend, the drink was discovered when goat herders in modern day Ethiopia where the bush originates, initially noticed the effect the plant had on animals. Slowly but surely the seed inside the fruit that grows on this bush, what we call the coffee bean, was recognised as the most potent part of the plant and an ancestor of the drink we consume today was born. Around the year 900, coffee took its first tentative steps into the world beyond Ethiopia when merchants or traders brought beans across the Red Sea to Yemen. This would become the first region in the world to be transformed by coffee, but certainly not the last. In the coming centuries, the world's first coffee industry emerged in Yemen, and in particular at the port of Mocha, which would dominate the trade and in later centuries even see a coffee drink, the Mocha, named after it. However, through much of the medieval period, coffee remained a niche drink within the Arab world. Initially, it was popular, in particular with the Sufis. Coffee allowed the followers of this mystic branch of Islam to pray late into the night, even after long days of physical labour. While it had established a foothold in the Arab world, even if it was a marginal one, for one reason or another, coffee did not reach Europe during the Middle Ages. Even during the sustained and increased contact, particularly during the Crusades, the drink remained exclusive to the lower Middle East and North East Africa. It was the 16th century that proved integral to the advance of coffee from this region to the wider world. In 1516, the Ottoman Empire, the rising power of Europe and Western Asia, conquered Egypt and coffee began to spread rapidly through this empire that was then the most powerful in the Mediterranean. It was also around this period what we might call an early coffee culture, for want of a better word, was starting to emerge. It was in coffee houses throughout the Islamic world that the drink became a social drink. These coffee houses were large open rooms where people sat around and talked and, and perhaps even more importantly conducted business. These were also places of entertainment as well and this would become really important in the story of coffee. A visitor to the Safavid Empire for example in modern day Iran gave a good account of what an early coffee house was like. People engage in conversation for it is there that news is communicated and where those interested in politics criticise the government in all freedom and without being fearful since the government does not heed what the people say. Innocent games are played. In addition, mullahs, dervishes and poets take turns telling stories in verse or in prose. The narrations by the mullahs and the dervishes are moral lessons like our sermons but it is not considered scandalous not to pay attention to them. The first coffee house in the Ottoman capital of Constantinople, modern-day Istanbul, opened in 1554 and this was followed by dozens more by the end of the century. Constantinople was the largest and most important port in the Mediterranean at the time and it was inevitable that coffee and indeed 
the emerging coffee culture would find its way to Europe in the coming decades. It was little surprise that coffee first appeared in Europe in the bustling Italian port of Venice in the early 17th century, and from there it began to spread rapidly across the continent. The first coffee house opened in London in the 1650s, and within a decade the drink had arrived in Dublin, when a certain Lionel Newman had opened a coffee house in the city by 1664. In these early years, coffee was heavily associated with the Ottoman Empire and Turkey. Indeed, London's first coffee house had been operated by a Turkish man in London called Pasqua Rose. Another early London coffee house was named after the city of Smyrna, the modern Turkish port of Izmir. In Dublin, this association continued. In 1664, when Lionel Newman, who operated the city's first coffee house, issued what were called trade tokens used by merchants when coinage was short, he stamped the image of a Turk's head on his tokens. Having gained a foothold in Dublin, other coffee houses began to open in the city, and as Moira Kennedy points out in her excellent article, Dublin's Coffee Houses of the 18th Century, they began to spread throughout Ireland. By the year 1700, there were coffee houses in Kilkenny, Clonmel and Limerick. However, the drink served in these establishments was not the coffee we enjoy today. In the 18th century, making a cup of coffee was a far more simplistic process than it is today. The coffee bean, a pale green colour in its natural state, was first roasted. The beans were crushed before being boiled then for 15 minutes. The resulting drink was very different to modern coffee. In appearance, it was much more like Turkish coffee, but it was much weaker in strength than what we enjoy. There are numerous accounts indicating that this was not the most tasty of beverages. Its popularity was all down to the effects it elicited, that it was addictive and equally important was the culture of socialising that went hand in hand with early coffee houses. While they shared common characteristics, much like modern pubs, early coffee houses varied from establishment to establishment, each catering for a certain type of customer. To get a sense of these coffee houses, Next, we will take a look at the two most famous in 18th century Dublin. The first coffee house we will look at is called Dick's, one of the most famous in Dublin in the 18th century. According to an English visitor, this was where you would find the best coffee in the city. Dick's was opened in the 1690s by a well-known Dubliner called Richard Pugh. Located right in the heart of the old city, looking out on Christchurch Cathedral, the customers were in plush surroundings in Dick's. The building had previously been the home of the Earl of Kildare, and the coffee house itself was located in ornate rooms on the first floor. Aside from the coffee, Dick's was also heavily associated with books and news. As was a common feature in coffee houses in this period, merchants often conducted their business in these establishments and Dick's was associated in particular with the book trade, with auctions of books being held in the yard behind the coffee house. Like all coffee houses, Dick's was also an important source of news in the city and this was part of their overall popularity. Newspapers themselves were expensive due to high taxes but patrons of Dick's could read the newspapers provided for free. Indeed, Richard Pugh himself even published one of Dublin's most famous newspapers at the time, Pugh's Occurrences. One observer commented that those who frequented Dick's lived on politics, coffee and news. A visitor also commented that customers frequently played board games, something that was very common in most coffee houses. Now, while Dick's was perhaps accommodating to the more discerning coffee drinker in 18th century Dublin, others were more raucous. A few streets away on Cork Hill, close to the entrance of Dublin Castle, Lucas's coffee house had a very different feel. To get a sense of what Lucas's was like, events there on January the 8th, 1748, give a sense of the establishment. On that cold winter's morning, crowds gathered in the courtyard of Lucas's. Windows in the buildings overlooking the courtyard were flung open as eager spectators were looking down on tensions building below. All eyes were focused on two men, Arthur Mervyn, and Francis Hamilton, who were about to fight a duel. Bets were placed on who would win. While the source of the dispute is unknown, Mervyn killed Hamilton in what was one of eight duels fought in the courtyard at the back of Lucas's coffee house between 1748 and 1758. That these duels took place at the back of Lucas's reflected the clientele. It was a place where Dublin's fashionable, wealthy, unruly young men socialised, but it was considered a dangerous spot in the evenings. Other coffee houses had their own unique characteristics. Those situated close to the law courts 
were known as haunts of legal professionals, while Daly's Coffee House attracted older, wealthier men and was notorious for gambling. Huge tracts of land were said to be won and lost on cards in Daly's. The coffee houses were also heavily associated with business dealings in the 18th century, and this also boosted their popularity. Previously, taverns had frequently been where merchants had met and often conducted business. However, coffee houses had an edge over these establishments. Alcohol was a dangerous drug when money was at stake, given it dulls the senses and makes you tired. Caffeine had precisely the opposite effect. It heightened the senses and made the merchant more alert. Furthermore, because they were increasingly associated with the latest news, merchants could find out pertinent information in coffee houses. Now, while coffee had gained a foothold in Ireland by the year 1700, it was still a drink of the elite. The price alone put it far beyond the vast majority of people. Initially, it was a rare commodity, making it highly expensive. This began to change slowly in the early 1700s. The Dutch started plantations on the island of Java, in modern-day Indonesia, and by 1730 they dominated the market, but by the time beans arrived in Dublin, they were still too expensive for the drink to grow in popularity among the poor. Prices and production again shifted in the later 18th century, as the drink followed European colonists to the Caribbean. The French started large-scale production on the island of Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, and by the 1780s nearly half the world's coffee was being produced on vast slave plantations on the island. The import of coffee to Ireland increased by 600% in the last 15 years of the 18th century and jumped by another 400% in the first 27 years of the 19th century. Nevertheless, while coffee was coming down in price, it still remained out of reach for most due to high taxation. I tried to find prices and the earliest I could come up with for Ireland was from the 1820s and 1830s and this gives you a sense of how much coffee cost at the time. In the 1820s, a pound of coffee, that's about 450 grams, cost somewhere between 24 pence and 60 pence depending on the quality. To put that in context, around this time a well-paid labourer in Dublin earned about 25 pence a day so that makes that coffee pretty expensive. Indeed, even buying a cup of coffee was something of a luxury for most people. In 1834, a bowl of coffee and a bread roll with butter cost around sixpence in Dublin, while an entire meal of meat, bread and potatoes only cost fivepence. Even for the rich, the way in which coffee was being consumed in this period reinforced the idea it was something of an elite drink. So while coffee grew in popularity through the coffee houses, These were exclusively the world of men in the 18th century. The only women permitted on these premises were the women who frequently ran them. That said, women weren't totally prohibited from drinking coffee, they just couldn't drink it in coffee houses. So those who could afford it would have drank it at home. For example, I came across a reference from 1788 from a Sir John Blaker, a one-time Chief Secretary for Ireland, who referenced in a speech that he had gone recently to the house of an aristocratic lady for a cup of coffee. Women would also have drank coffee at public events such as balls. However, it was clear their experience of the drink was very different to that of men. So far, we have seen how coffee had arrived in Ireland and was largely a drink of the wealthy. The story of how coffee became a working class drink will be the focus of part two, which is out next week. But for the rest of this episode, we're going to turn to a neglected aspect of the Irish history of coffee. This will take us behind the scenes of coffee production into the brutal world of Cuban slave plantations that wasn't as far from Ireland as we might like to think. As coffee gained in popularity, it became an increasingly lucrative market for merchants in the 18th century. This saw the coffee industry transformed. Whereas the world's coffee had been largely produced by peasant farmers in Yemen, by the middle of the 18th century, European empires, driven by a ruthless pursuit of profit, had transformed it into a vast industry that exploited slave labour. Slave-produced coffee totally dominated the markets by the 1770s. The coffee being consumed in places like Dick's or Lucas's coffee houses in Dublin was being produced in horrific conditions in the Caribbean, where people kidnapped along the west coast of Africa were forced to spend their lives working in gruelling conditions on coffee plantations. Indeed, these horrific conditions led to the first successful slave rebellion on what was the French island of Saint-Domingue, which was renamed the Republic of Haiti by the former slaves who had freed themselves. 
After this rebellion, many of the former French plantation owners fled Haiti and established a similar industry on the neighbouring island of Cuba. Giselle Gonzalez Garcia, a Cuban researcher in the Irish Studies Department at Concordia University, Montreal, has followed the story of an Irish man, James Jenkinson Wright, who would become a leading figure in the new Cuban coffee industry. Indeed, this Dubliner would go on to own one of the largest coffee plantations in eastern Cuba. I interviewed Giselle about her fascinating research into Wright and his Cuban plantations. I started by asking Giselle about the origins of the Cuban coffee industry. She first explains how it took off when the French coffee planters fled the nearby island of Saint-Domingue, modern-day Haiti, after the slave revolt there. They were helped to establish plantations by a Spaniard of Irish descent, Sebastian Kindelan O'Regan. The audio quality in the interview does vary at times, but Giselle's research is absolutely fascinating, so it's well worth sticking with it. So Cuba didn't become uh, a huge coffee uh, producer until, I think, 1800s, 1810, that period, right after the Haitian Revolution, because all those wealthy coffee planters that were fleeing, fleeing from Haiti, they went to Santiago, which is, you look at it geographically, it's, it's very close. So by 1800s, um, refugees from Saint-Domingue start arriving in the coast of Cuba. And the Spanish authorities, which actually uh, the governor of Santiago at the time was uh, a member of the Irish Hispanic, um, his name was Sebastian uh, Kindelan Oregon. Uh, and he's I'm trying to track his family, but um, it seems that they went to Spain uh, late uh, 18th century and they became a part of this, that Spanish military elite. And then he was born in Ceuta, which is uh, in the north coast of Africa. And then he, um, he had like a, um, an important military career and eventually his like top position was were in Cuba uh, as governor of Santiago and as governor of the whole island. And he's the one being credited for welcoming this French refugees from Haiti and uh, settling them into Santiago and allowing them to buy land, to uh, buy property uh, and to start the coffee industry. These French settlers did not last long in Cuba due to events back in Europe. Napoleon's invasion of Spain in the early 19th century would see them all exiled from Cuba. This opened the door for merchants from Baltimore in the USA to come to Cuba and get involved in the coffee industry, and these included several Irish people. And between 1810 and 1814, when all the French people had to leave the, the, the Spanish domains, including Cuba, uh, several merchants uh, from Baltimore uh, stepped in and started buying off of the French uh, all this very cheap land and, and that already had the the coffee plantations in them. So uh, I would say some of them were Irish. Uh, the ones that I've been following are Irish, uh, but I uh, there are um, obviously uh, Americans, there are uh, Englishmen, um, and what is very uh, interesting about them is that this didn't uh, seem to run through ethnic lines. They were associating themselves in this very transnational uh, way. Giselle has focused her research on a Dubliner called James Jenkinson Wright and she explained how he went from a childhood in Ireland to owning a coffee plantation in Cuba. So I'm following uh, one case um, which is the case of uh, Quaker Tom Protestant. He was Born, he was born in Dublin in 1788. Uh, his name was James Jenkinson Wright. This family emigrated to the United States early um, 1800s, 18, 1800, 1801. Uh, and in the United States, they became uh, pioneers in the Ohio. And then they founded a city there and mostly a Quaker enclave in, in this area. One of the members of this member of this family, uh, James Jenkins on right, that I've been following, he very early on, he went to Baltimore and started working with merchants there and 
I, I don't know in which capacity initially, I think maybe as a clerk, uh, but I think he's uh, very quickly picked up the, the business because by 1812, and he went to Bal Baltimore in 1807, uh, by 1812, he was already like going to Cuba and buying property in Cuba and getting in, um, immersed in in this whole um, coffee business in, in Santiago. I asked Giselle to explain a bit about the coffee industry that Wright was moving into. What the French did uh, to kind of like promote this boom of coffee in, in, in the area of Santiago is that they brought in uh, thousands of slaves uh, to work on, the, on these plantations. This region had not, um, before that, they didn't have a big um, African slave population because the, the slaves were concentrated in the um, western part of the island where the um, sugar plantations were. So the French are credited for doing the, this. Giselle then explained the enormous plantation Wright would establish in Cuba. Uh, yes. So he bought not one plantation. He bought uh, between six and seven different plantations. The, so the main one that he um, purchased was named La Sofia. Uh, Sophie It's uh, the name that he, um, he gave them. Uh, and this um, Sophie plantation... Uh, is known today as the Big Sophie. And my theory is that his, all the plantations that he bought were adjacent to that one. So at some point, they combined them and they became the Big uh, Sophie plantation. And what is very uh, peculiar about this plantation it is, is that it's the biggest one in the whole region of Santiago. And it, this implies that he was the wealthiest um, landowner and uh, also the biggest slaveholder uh, in the whole region. His uh, Sophie plantation, just his Sophie plantation, had more than 350 slaves, which and on average, I think uh, all the other coffee plantations with there, there were more than 500, had less than 100 slaves. So he had huge, huge um piece of land and he was producing a lot of coffee. Uh, another thing that is um, import important about him is that he was a planter and at the same time he was a merchant. So he was also doing the export of the product to the US and to France with his business partners. Giselle now explains what the big Sophie plantation would have looked like in the early 19th century. This plantation had a very large, what they call batteries of slates, which they had to accommodate 350 slates, perhaps perhaps more, because we think we, he was understating the amount of slate that he had. Um, this also had an area uh, to uh, dry the coffee, which is called segadero in Spanish. Uh, it had um, the, the technology to... Um, process the, the coffee through the wet method, which is the French uh, from Haiti method. It's the top one at the time. Um, and it's a, it's a huge, it was a huge compound of, of um, interconnected uh, facilities. Uh, and it also had the, the house, the, 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 the plantation house, which is where Wright himself lived for a number of years. Uh, and this house is higher double function. They were um, a warehouse in the, in the inferior level and they were like a, the planter's house uh, on the top level. They had like a two stories. And uh, it, it was a social space, but at the same time it was a production space. Beyond the coffee plantations, Wright was also involved directly in the slave trade itself, as Giselle now explains. He got himself involved uh, in the slave trade. So uh, he owned ships that went to the coast of Africa to get slaves for his plantations in Santiago. Um, he associated with two, uh, three local individuals. Uh, when I say local, is that they were living in Santiago, but one was Spanish uh, by the name of Antonio Vinent, uh, 
and I think he facilitated things for for right uh, early on because uh, he translated for him. He didn't know the language, uh, uh, and eventually they went into business together uh, with also with an uh, American man named Henry Shelton and with an Englishman called Thomas Brooks. So this is a very transnational venture from very early on. I asked Giselle, do we know anything about the slaves who would have worked on the Grand Sophie plantation? We don't know the the names. We haven't recovered the the names of all of his slaves yet. We have recovered some of them. Uh, And I think the fact that Wright himself had been um, involved with the African illegal trade, because by the time that he was engaged on the slave trade, uh, it had already been declared illegal by the British. Uh, this ha- this represented a very high risk um, enterprise for him, but it also had like high rewards because he was able to sell these slaves uh, to other planters at a very high price uh, and keep some of them for himself. So I think um, most of his slaves had had to have been born in in Africa. So what is is what they were. Um, it's what historians call bosales. They they are uh, from Africa. Given slavery was central to production of coffee in Cuba, I asked Giselle what conditions these people worked under. Based on uh, the size of his plantation, which was the biggest one, and the size of the slave population that he controlled, that to control that amount of slaves, there must have been some degree of violence involved because it's just uh, impossible, especially in a period of time where uh, the Haiti revolution had already happened and uh, slaves were aware of that and they were gaining more and more conscious about uh, they shouldn't uh, be held as slave. As was common in such situations, Wright fathered several children with female slaves on the plantation. He had himself engaged with um, African mistresses and he had children with them he had eight children uh, with african women and he never recognized these children legally he even says that uh, that he doesn't consider them his own offspring but he provided for them very specifically in his will and Wright's mentality, and this is what I focus on mostly, was not only uh, very conservative from a religious point of view and from a political point of view, it was also very conservative from a social point of view. He did he considered them inferior and not worthy of his... Um, uh, I wouldn't say his name because they legally got his name because... Um, in Cuba and in Spain domains, when a master owned a certain amount of slaves, those slaves had his name, like his surname. Uh, but he didn't consider them uh, worthy of his wealth, for, for instance. He provided some means for them, but it was very modest in comparison with the amount of money that he had. While Wright had left Ireland decades earlier, he was frequently in touch with two aunts living in Dublin. However, they were committed Quakers opposed to the slave trade, and this caused tensions. So a part of his family, a significant part of his family, immigrated to the United States, and he arrived in Cuba from Baltimore. But uh, two of his aunts uh, and a few of his cousins remained in in, in Dublin. Uh, they were uh, linen traders, and they were merchants in um, uh, Skinner Road. I uh, think later is... Uh, Chris Church place or something. So his aunts, which are uh, named Martha Wright and Rachel Jenkinson, uh, he was in, uh, in um, constant correspondence with them between 1834 and 1844, uh, 45. He dies in 45. Um, and he, specifically his aunt uh, Martha was the main recipient of all of his correspondence. And it's a very um, interesting um, collection of letters. It's at the the Society of Friends Library in Dublin. Um, they are the uh, holders of this collection. Um, this uh, he always underplayed his role as as a slave owner, and for his family, this was a great um, deal of shame for them because 
Quakers were anti-slavery. They were very, uh, I would say, um, involved in the abolition uh, movement, not only in Ireland, also in the United States. Uh, his family, I think, um, frowned upon him that he had become not only a Catholic, was already a very difficult thing, but also a slave owner, a big slave owner, because he, and he says so in his letters to his aunt, that he owned um, that much uh, slaves. He plays himself as a benevolent master, which is, um, we think he was entirely the opposite. But in, in, with his family, he's always trying to justify how good he is to his slaves, how uh, he treats them better than the landlords and uh, treated the, the peasants in Ireland. He makes that comparison very often, which is ridiculous, of course. But <laughs> um, And he always um, seems to picture Cuba as this tranquil, uh, nothing happens land, which it was far from, from that. Cuba was already booming with uh, independence ideas and some of the big um, rebellions of slaves happened at this time and he never commented on them. He, he seemed to be up in his plantation in the mountains, very removed from all of this. Moreover, uh, he he was a very uh, hard critic um, um, critic, critic of uh, Richard Wolver, Madam, uh, the Irish um, uh, abolitionist. Madam was in Cuba at the same time that Wright was in Cuba, and his aunts uh, must have asked him. Uh, we don't have their letters, unfortunately. We only have his letters, but they must have asked him what he thought of uh, of Madam's work in Cuba, which was remarkable. And Wright was like, oh, no, no, that guy is a charlatan. You shouldn't believe anything he he writes. He's, like, exaggerating. Things are not like he says they are. Um, and, I, and he couldn't stand uh, Madam or, or the British authorities um, that were promoting uh, the, the end of slavery. Indeed, his aunts in Dublin were so opposed to his business dealings that they considered his money dirty and refused to spend it. His aunts in Ireland, they, they, they were having financial trouble. And he was sending them remittances. He was sending them money uh, back to Ireland. And when one of his aunts died, his aunt, his aunt Rachel, Rachel Jenkinson, uh, they found the aunt, um, uncollected money, like the bills, without claiming them she never used the money it was the slave money for her probably and so she has some ethical boundaries there that um, stop her from uh, even though she needed it she stopped her from claiming this money which for us was mind-blowing that uh, to find that out I'd really like to thank Giselle for her fascinating insights into the coffee industry in Cuba and James Jenkinson Wright if you want to get in touch with Giselle, I've included her email in the show notes attached with this episode. Now next week we'll continue the story of coffee in Ireland, looking at how it became a working class drink, including fascinating details of one of Ireland's first coffee chains, which started in Belfast in the later 19th century. In the meantime, my bonus series on medieval life, exclusively available for patrons, continues early next week. You can find out more about that on patreon.com forward slash Irish podcast. Until next time, Sloan.